In September 2005, 50 Freedom Drivers from Ireland, together with Freedom Drivers from England, Austria, Germany, France and Norway, embarked upon their journey to the European Parliament, Court of Human Rights and the European Council in Strasbourg, France. This is the second campaign of this nature organised by the European Network of Independent Living, otherwise known as ENAL, which is the umbrella organisation of the Centre for Independent Living, or CIL, in respective EU countries. We have been marginalised, discriminated and institutionalised. This has not allowed us to participate democratically and equally within all aspects of our society. We are all fighting for the same thing, no matter what country you're from. We are all fighting for, you know, for the right of disabled people. I think we create that kind of image around Ireland that we're wonderfully happy and, you know, we have a lovely life and all the rest of it. But I think over the last number of years in Ireland, we're beginning to address uh, the type of society that we live in, which is basically a, a very cruel society. How do we treat disabled people globally? In other words, do we really, I think we all, perhaps the lip service, but, but, but actually if we scratch in our minds, how, what do we think of the disabled? Are they a priority? Are they human beings? Do we treat them as such? And I think we have not addressed that at all, and, and certainly I've got that message today. The Freedom Drive of 2005 is essentially a continuation of the struggle for the disability movement to achieve 1. The right to independent living 2. The right to personal assistance 3. The allocation of 5% of overseas development aid to the majority world for people with disabilities. ENIO, the European Network for Independent Living, was started here in Strasbourg in 89. We, we were had the establishing meeting in the Council of Europe. We need from all European countries and from the uh, Euro, uh, independent living centres in all the European countries to to move forward and um, and um, work uh, towards a, a European model for personal assistance. I we have. To get our PS system standby We need PS service to be available to all those that need it. We need PA consistency throughout Ireland and indeed throughout Europe because that indeed is, is affecting our labour movement. That a personal assistant is like my arms and my legs because I look down and I know that my legs work and my arms work but if they didn't it makes me think and then it makes me think about the absolute you know that it's absolutely essential that somebody has a personal assistant otherwise they can't live independently. We need core employment for our PAs to, to allow consistency and for us to develop our own career and our own education. The day-to-day -day issues of people living with disabilities, the problems are enormous. The transport getting to Strasbourg was very difficult. I think some people getting in and out of their own homes is very difficult. As someone that's uh, trying to get a, a personal assistant myself and struggling for a long time, I hope maybe that I'm not I'm not begging all that and I hope it'll be a start of a new life for myself because uh, you know, things are getting harder. We are here to tell you that we still fight for the right to have our personal assistance so we can live our lives. Yeah, to have more hours with your PA and to allow movement within the EU with your PA. People with disabilities have always been treated like second or third class citizens. We have been denied the right to make decisions regarding our own lives, both within the family and society. We don't want to live in institutions. We want to use money and take our own independence the way that we look after ourselves. We decide what we do. Up to the age of 18, I lived in an institution. I came out of it continued school, left school, 
then Linda ended up in a limbo again with nowhere to go. They wanted to send me to another institution in Dublin and I said no. You know, is it really um, acceptable that three million people, fro- the three million disabled people, disabled citizens of the EU, are um, forced to live in institutions and particularly not by choice? It's a human rights abuse not to let somebody make basic choices around their life, you know, have mobility, be able to work and study, and be able to live independently. But we've got to educate people. You know, sometimes one situation is so so degrading that they don't see the degrading part of another situation. You know what I mean? And we have to educate MEPs that this is equally a human rights abuse to confine people in what are effectively prisons. Institutions just reinforce us as, as people that need charity, how much money they make and how little of it actually goes into what we need. The excellent arguments put by CIL and by others, and I have many years through Kenneth Kilduff and many other colleagues in Wexford, been conscious of the arguments, been pursuing the relevant ministers, and amazed that even on a purely cost-effectiveness basis, part altogether from the dignity and self-determination argument that you rightfully make, cost effectively. It would be, I think, save the government money to keep people out of very, very expensive full-time care. We urge you to to establish independent living as a right and to develop the long-term policy phasing out of institutional living in Europe in order to eradicate the violation of disabled people's human rights in institutions. We are not sick and don't want to live in institutions. We are sending our warm sympathies to our brothers and sisters that are imprisoned in institutions all over in Europe. We have the right to to live for free like free people and not in prisons. Uh, Our slogan is institutions, I'm not solutions. In real terms, if the kind of agenda that the independent living movement is talking about is going to progress forward, what is it we need to be doing to convince and persuade parliamentarians to progress that? Very persistent campaigning, very consistent knocking on doors and very consistent reminding people of the uh, the amount of people that that affects not only specifically people with disabilities but their friends their relatives their so that you're on the one hand explaining very clearly what it means in terms of fundamental rights but on the other hand in terms of politicians you're also explaining what it means in terms of voting power because that is that that is unfortunately for for many people what what it comes down to and i think and i think that's that's a strength that uh, that that people shouldn't lose sight of what is it you think we should be doing to make our case heard? I think we should be um, obviously doing a lot more campaigning and I think we, we, we can do that within our individual organisations but I think you know the disability, I, th- I think the disability movement has to really get its act together and we have to collectively raise the profile of this and keep it on the agenda and there's lots of different ways that we can do that but I think we have to keep um, you know, our finger on the pulse. We should continue at the campaign at home. I continue to lobby our local TDs and our national TDs and to make people more aware of independent living uh, and how important it is to a person with a disability. I'd like to see uh, more people who are able to become more actively involved in the, in the, in the movement. The most important way for us disabled people to to go on uh, being part of society is to have jobs. And I think that's important for the CILs too, because we will never be recognized uh, as we should be in society if not more of us have jobs.